there is a story okay, about a man walking along the beach and then you see one dead fish and you say, what's wrong with the fish? But if you're walking along the beach and you see hundreds of thousands of dead fishes, you ask what's wrong with the water. So Nigeria is what's wrong with the water. It's not the people. For you to have such consistently corrupt, inept people from local government to state to federal, we need to look at the system. We need to look at the culture. So it's important that the politician is separated from the thief because not every politician is a thief. Many people started out like you. They went in there to make a difference. But there is something about the culture, the political culture that co-opts and corrupts the best. And we need to understand that. And that that's what needs to be fixed. Okay, um, <laughs> so you said many people started out like me. And um, it just took me to a particular point. We were having breakfast in my house on the Sunday morning. And um, while we're eating, I'm usually like the most vocal person at the table. So I told my dad that, the way this country is going back, even me, when I, when I enter that government, it's how I would, I would collect money. My family has to be better. My dad was like, no, my son, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. But this is the weird thing. I'm a spoken word poet. So, like when I write my poems, I write my poems, um, um, I even tell my friends that my poems are supposed to correct the perspective I bring, supposed to correct the ills of society, one person at a time. As long as this person gets it, somehow the person begins to share it with their friends when they talk and all of that. But how much of a role do we have as spoken word poets? And I ask this because you have been for over 10 years now. I, I, I asked a couple of your colleagues, and yeah, for about 10 years, um, the night of spoken word was in, started in like 2012. So that's like 10 years. What's the role of the spoken word poet, the writer, the the everyday conscious mind in changing that narrative? Just um, I think artists have a major role to play. Uh, let me make something clear. I'm not a, I'm not an entertainer. I chose art, uh, poetry, entertainment very consciously. Um, I came to this whole thing at a much older age. I had finished, um, I had done my masters, uh, and I studied law and development. Development is a study of societies. Why are some societies best world and others third world? That question, though, yeah. why? It's, it's a question that bothered me in school. Uh, and so I decided to, to study. That's why I read it a lot. I can't summarize anything here. Yeah. However, one of the things, conclusions I came to about Nigeria was that we have the laws, we have this structures, we have the institutions, they're all there on paper, but they don't work. And they don't work because of the person or the people that are supposed to apply these laws or run these institutions. These people have a mentality. They have a culture, they have a way of doing things that guarantees. Because a car can do 200 kilometers per hour, <laughs> but if the person driving it chooses to stay at 20 or 30. It's the person, it's not the car. It's, it's the, the country can be the greatest country in the world. We have everything it takes, but the mentality of our people. So I came to the conclusion that our greatest problem is cultural, not structural. Not that we don't have problems with structure. Not that we can't reform the constitution. Not that we can't take out with things that make things better. But I came to the conclusion that our primary problem is a cultural problem. But we needed to have some sort of challenge to our mindset and how we see things. And there are certain gateways to the mind of the society and the heart of the society. Uh, you have the family, uh, you have education, you have religion, and you have entertainment. These are some of the most basic gateways when you're trying to deal with hearts and minds. You know, you're either looking at what parents do at home, the teacher standing in front of young, impressionable minds, an imam or a pastor at a, on a pulpit. These are times when people are really vulnerable and they open up their heart to you, not their brain. Nothing wrong with our brain. We have first-class brains, but there's something wrong with our hearts. 
And then you have entertainment. When people are having fun, you're able to reach their hearts. And um, I decided that I had this gift, spoken word. I had stumbled onto it unintentionally. I used to just write poems. I didn't think there was anything to it. But once in my late twenties, I was invited. I was, in, I, I was living in the UK at the time. I was invited by uh, Ghanaian students, undergrads, who were doing the 50th anniversary of Ghana's independence at the time, and they invited me to their show to come and read a poem. And I thought it would be a gathering like this, or like uh, an open mic, where you have poetry lovers and whatever. So I went there with my buttoned up shirt and my, my sweater and my glasses and you know my like you went there like me. Yes. Like right now. Yes. <laughs> you know? And I got there and I met a proper rave. I mean it was a party and young late teens, early twenties. People were on stage, they were rapping. So my brother that's why he hates poetry, <laughs> refresh rap. They were rapping, they were break dancing, they were and I thought, I don't belong here. Is it these guys that are going to listen to poem? And somebody has set me up. I, I was with my girlfriend at the time. I said, maybe we can just sneak out the back. So she was like, look, nobody knows you. Even if you mess up, you know, just go. <laughs> and, you know, so I said, you know, what the hell? So I went up on stage. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I told them. I said, please, I'm not a rapper. I'm not, I can't dance. I can't. And these children are booing. So get off the stage, get off the stage, you know, honestly, some jam jamu, you know, jamu people, you know, very, you know, so, but as a Nigerian guy, you know, you know, if you push us, we push back, that's <laughs> <laughs> the Nigerian spirits, you know, you ought to show me, that's when I was born and bred in Lagos, you know, so I'm very gentle, quiet, but if you push me, the Lagos shall will come out. I like men to help you guys, or you will listen to this poem, whether you like it. <laughs> I brought out my paper and I just started reading it. And to my surprise, everywhere was there going quiet. Pain dropped silence. I was the only act that got a start innovation from just reading a wow. on a piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, that was when I realized that poetry was something I could use to communicate to society. And from then on, I started using it very intentionally to attack popular culture and mindsets in Nigeria because I think that really certain ideas have to be sown into the popular culture for the country to shift, particularly around issues of identity, tribalism, religious bigotry, how we see ourselves. If we cannot get past that, if we cannot get past your inability to judge me, once you hear my name is DK Trukumeriji, that means he's Southern, that means he's Igbo, that means he's Christian, that means therefore if he is Christian, therefore he is like this, if he is Igbo, therefore he is like this. You, without even hearing me out, without even experiencing me, without even giving me a chance, I've already become either your enemy or your ally. These are the things that need to change if the country is going to move forward.